Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming uh, on, I think, towards the end of the conference. And uh, so I'm just going to introduce myself and my colleague here. Uh, my name is Ali Raza. I am the chief architect for quality engineering at Splunk. And I'm Bill Houston, uh, senior release engineer at Splunk. Let's see, we're going to start off with a brief introduction to Splunk. Uh, we're going to talk about our development process and the build pipelines we use at Splunk uh, with Jenkins. Uh, we're going to talk about how release engineering uses uh, Splunk and Jenkins, and how quality engineering uses Splunk and Jenkins, um, and uh, how QTI uses Splunk to improve the productivity and experience. And we're going to explain how we use Splunk to make sense of all the data that comes from, uh, from Jenkins. Uh, so just, tonight, just to get a, a feel, uh, how many of you in the room are using Splunk right now in your organization? Wow, quite a few, so about a little bit more than half. And how many have at least heard of Splunk before? Okay, all right, good. Uh, so for those of you who might have never heard of Splunk, I'll just do a little one-liner of what Splunk is. Uh, you know, Splunk is enterprise software, makes it super easy to collect, analyze, and really understand the, the data that's being generated by your security systems, your applications like Jenkins, and your technology infrastructure. Once you have all the data, Splunk can really give you insights into, you know, how to make some kind of business decisions or some kind of how to drive operational performance in your units. Um, it is an enterprise software. Uh, it's a commercial software. Uh, but you can download it for free if you haven't used it. You can go to Splunk.com and download it, and you can use it for free forever up to 500 megabytes a day. Uh, Bill and I do not work in sales, so you don't have to worry about us trying to upsell you anything. Uh, so sit back and relax and enjoy the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, just a little bit about how we have, how we're using Jenkins at Splunk. Uh, Splunk's about 600 or so engineers uh, across San Francisco, Cupertino, Seattle, uh, Vancouver, and Shanghai. Uh, and a bunch of these teams have their own Jenkins clusters. Uh, <coughs> so Bill and I work in, I work in QE and Bill works in release engineering, so we'll mostly be talking about our dev CI systems, uh, and I'll be talking about the quality and engineering CI systems as it relates to the, the, the core platform team. Um, our talk will be focused on Jenkins and Splunk. And towards the end, uh, this is something I'm super excited to show, is how we've built a plugin for Jenkins that sends data in real time from Jenkins into Splunk, and how we also have an app for Jenkins for Splunk so that you can see the return on investment within five minutes. So towards the end, uh, I really encourage you to stick around and so you can see the demo um, and hopefully and this is geared towards the open source community, so you will be able to use it at some point. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the uh, development pipeline. Um, when I first uh, undertook to rebuild our uh, DevCI system two years ago, um, the tests were very slow, they were unreliable, uh, they used a polling system to check for uh, commits into the database, and so uh, multiple commits were tested at each time, and developers were unsure whose change had broken things, because sometimes you'd have five or ten commits going in to testing at one time. So developers got spammed with a lot of information about failed tests that they didn't care about, and everyone very quickly lost confidence in it. They started um, rooting those emails into the trash, and the whole system just sort of fell apart. So um, that's what I was faced with when I started. So I had to bring up a system that was reliable that everyone could have confidence in. And that's, that's where we're heading. That's where we are today. So, um, so we test every single commit that goes into Bitbucket uh, for certain branches. So we don't have enough infrastructure to test every single one of our branches. There's a lot of branches in our repository. Um, Splunk runs on a lot of different platforms. Uh, we test on the four primary platforms, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and Solaris, um, for every single commit to most of our feature branches and our main branch and several uh, development branches that have been deemed important, to, more, <coughs> excuse me, important enough to have that kind of testing. 
Um, so everything starts when a developer commits a change into Bitbucket. Um, an HTTP request post receive hook sends a trigger to Jenkin Jenkins. So we don't rely on polling. Bitbucket tells us when a change has happened. Um, that trigger gets sent to a trigger forwarder queue system. And why do we have that in place? Well, it provides a layer of security. So our Jenkins production box is uh, protected by Active Directory credentials. We didn't want to expose those in Bitbucket to anyone who could get access to that system. So we use um, an API token to allow uh, uh, Bitbucket to send a trigger to the forwarder, and then the forwarder adds the Active Directory credentials in a secure way and forwards it on to the Jenkins production system. It also gives me the ability to have a single switch that I can use to turn off triggers. So if I need to bring Jenkins down for some reason, I have some change, something's going wrong, I can flip that switch, and I can't stop Bitbucket from sending triggers on every commit, but this system holds those triggers in a queue and waits until I'm ready to turn them back on again so that I can resume testing. Um, I can forward the triggers to multiple places. So I have a single point of contact for Bitbucket, but from this forwarder, I can send the triggers anywhere I want to. So I have multiple Jenkins masters. I can send the triggers on to all of them. It also verifies that the trigger was properly received by Jenkins. So it makes sure that I get the proper response back showing that the proper job picked up that trigger and I know that uh, Jenkins has good hold on it. Uh, if I don't see that happen, then I take that trigger and I put it back into the queue again, and it gets sent over again until Jenkins finally takes it in the appropriate way. And finally, this is just a simple Jenkins system that I use to do this. So it's a small master, uh, doesn't have any agents, it just runs on its own and, and acts as a forwarder. So once uh, the trigger forwarder uh, has that, it sends a trigger on to the Jenkins master. Um, the Jenkins master looks at the branch that this is targeted at and decides that that's one of the branches we're going to test. And then it looks at the commit and sees what kind of changes were included in that commit and decides what set of tests it should run based on that information. Uh, it then starts the tests on uh, nodes on all the required platforms monitors those tests uh, through to completion and uh, collects all the results back into that top level test and uh, has everything ready there for someone to look at. Um, once the test is done, the results from that set of tests get posted back to Bitbucket, the developer who put the commit in in the first place and to Splunk. Uh, we use HipTat notifications pretty extensively here. Um, it allows me to send timely updates directly to the developer involved without spamming the whole team. So I, there's a HipChat notifier plugin that's included or available for Splunk, but it sends to a room, uh, which means everyone who wanted to get notifications would have to subscribe to that room. Uh, I didn't want to use that, so I have a, a Groovy script that uses the HipChat REST API and sends those notifications right to the individual rather than a whole group of people. Through an example of the script here, it's probably pretty easy to follow through, but if anyone wants to know how we do it, there it is. Um, we also test every pull request that goes into any branch in the system. Um, those tests only run on Linux, and we have a number of Linux agents, so we're able to actually allow this to run for everything. Uh, the triggering system works a little bit differently, though. So uh, the um, developers uh, commit or open a pull request, and as soon as they open a pull request, the uh, system gets a trigger and runs a test on that pull request. Subsequent to that, um, you have to trigger the test with a manual, uh, manually with a button in the UI. And we did that because we don't want every single commit that goes into an open pull request to be tested. Developers may not be ready to test. They're uh, doing uh, code reviews with their peers, and uh, they want to wait until they're ready. You know, they've made all the changes that everyone thinks. They know they're ready to go. Then they can push the button and actually trigger a test. So. We've added this uh, trigger dev CI button up in the corner of the pull request UI. And uh, as soon as I click that, 
it fires off a trigger to, uh, to Jenkins Master to start the test. The Jenkins Master sends a hip chat notification back to the developer to say, I got the trigger and I'm going to start the test running. So they get some immediate feedback that their request was received. And uh, once everything is done, again, the notification, the results get posted back to, uh, to various different sources here. The only difference in this case is we also uh, pull the list of reviewers out of the, uh, uh, the pull request uh, information available in Bitbucket, and I send a HipChat notification to the reviewers who are on that uh, pull request as well, so they all know that a test has been run and that it's finished. Um, and then the results back to Bitbucket uh, go into a comment in, in Bitbucket. So actually when you start the test, I create a comment in Bitbucket that says that a test, uh, in the pull request, that says that a test has been triggered and it's in the queue. And then uh, as the test progresses through the system, the comment is updated so that uh, the current status is always noted in the pull request. And I use the same comment over and over again, so I don't want to spam the pull request UI with a whole bunch of different comments. In this case, one comment gets reused continuously till the test finally completes. Um, so this is what you get when a test has been scheduled. Uh, then once it's out of the queue and running, you get a notification that it's running, and there's a link here that let, you can click on that will take you to that running job if you want to. Um, again, as I said, we don't want to spam the people. We just give them the comments right there, but reuse that same one comment over and over again. And then once the test is finally done, the results come back. You get a notification whether the success, uh, test was successful, whether uh, it was uh, a failure, um, or whether it's unstable, meaning uh, actually here, because Bitbucket only supports two kinds of notifications, I'll say that it's failed again. But really, it means that one or more tests failed. Uh, but the build itself was successful. Um, we also have those notifications coming back in HipChat. Here's an example. So the first one shows the, the notification you get when the trigger starts, and the second one shows the notification when uh, the job is complete. In this case, it sends you to the pull request itself, because we're trying to keep the developers out of, uh, out of Jenkins if we can. We, I don't want them in Jenkins fooling around. None of them have the ability to start jobs there. They can view anything they want, but the information is not as well presented in, in Jenkins as it is in other sources here. So we t send them to the pull request first, and hopefully then from there they can go directly to the test results page in the Jenkins UI if they need to see more details about the test results. And can we do the questions at the end? Thank you. Um, so, forgot to click the slide, sorry. Um, <clears throat> one of the goals is to keep the system maintainable and extensible. So everything's generic as possible. Um, all the scripts and property files that run this system are stored in Bitbucket. Um, when I make a commit to change one of those files, it sends a trigger to Jenkins Master, and the Jenkins Master can pull a copy of all the scripts and property files out of the repository and reload them onto the master, a fresh copy. Um, every slave node pulls a fresh copy of the files at the beginning of every job, so they always start a job with the freshest files from the repository. I have a staging system that mirrors, mirrors the production system, set up with a Jenkins, uh, uh, sorry, a Bitbucket uh, staging repository that mirrors the master repository so I can work on uh, property files and scripts in the staging system when I'm sure they're ready to go to production, merge them to production, which triggers the production system to pick them up. Keeping the system reliable so that it's always there for developers when they need it. Some nodes are restarted re regularly, particularly Windows boxes have a habit of becoming pretty unstable. Um, and so I actually reboot uh, each Windows box after each use so that it starts off uh, fresh. Um, I have a script that analyzes the results of the job at the end of every test. So it looks to particularly, uh, in this case, I'm going to talk about infrastructure failures. So if the if the test failed because we, it was, the machine was low on disk space or some issue recurred with memory or some networking problem occurred, those kinds of things, I look through the log file for indications of those. And if I find something that looks like an infrastructure failure, then um, <coughs> I can actually uh, re-trigger that test using the Naginator plugin and uh, take that node offline 
Uh, I have a cleanup script, a maintenance script, that uh, looks to see what the failure was and tries to clean the machine up to make it usable again. It can be rebooted, the disk space can be, uh, disk can be cleaned, a number of different operations can be performed to try and bring that node back into a, a usable condition again. Um, the Jenkins home directory is stored on an NFS mount. So it's, all that's on the actual Jenkins production master is the, the war file and uh, the, the service startup instructions and one file out of the home directory that is the file that identifies what node this is or what the master's uh, uh, DNS name is for the system. Uh, there's a uh, symbolic link on the NFS mount that points back to whatever machine is running uh, as the master where it has its own identification file. Um, the Splunk plugin monitors the Jenkins master and all the nodes, so all the log files, a uh, complete set of statistics about memory use, et cetera. Ellie's gonna go into more of this when, when he gives his presentation, but all that data is sent by the Splunk plugin on a regular basis up to Splunk so we can monitor the health of the system from, uh, from Splunk. And we can set up alerts on Splunk, so if we see something going wrong in the system, um, we can have an alert sent out so that one of us is available to get online and find out what's going on and take care of it. So I want to also be responsible to the developer's needs, so we're trying to keep everything as fast as possible. Uh, I have a Bitbucket reference repository. There was a session earlier, I think actually one of the demo sessions out there uh, in the open source uh, kiosk. Uh, talking about this, but a reference repository on every node gets updated every night at midnight um, or thereabouts um, so that each node has that a fresh copy of the reference repository available to it and every job runs using that reference repository. So instead of the uh, git clone times taking 10 to 15 minutes, some of them finish in less than 30 seconds. So it just grabs a few files and it's ready to go. Um, the same Linux nodes run both the commit tests and the pull request tests, and when we have peak loads as we're approaching a release date, developers are making a lot of uh, pull request tests, and they need their responses back as quickly as possible. So I have a script that monitors the queue size for pull request tests, and when I see it start to get too large, I start to pull resources away from the commit tests and defer, the, uh, defer those tests so I pull everything over to run more quickly on uh, pull, pull request tests more quickly. Um, allows us to clear that queue out pretty fast and then we can go back to uh, processing commit uh, checks again. And since the commit checks run on every single commit still, even if I queue up an hour's worth of commit tests, uh, we still can identify where a breakage occurs if it occurs because we have a test for every single commit. Um, again, the data for every job gets sent to Splunk, so we can examine it. Um, you can search through the log files, you can look at test results and uh, identify uh, test failures and why they happen by doing searches uh, in Splunk. Um, it's doing all that has allowed us to be a lot more efficient and responsive to the developers. Um, the other thing that this thing does is, uh, I mentioned that script that runs at the end that looks for infrastructure failures. Well, it also diagnoses build and test failures at the end of every run. So uh, if I see something like a git merge failed, um, that gets put into the hip chat notification and the, um, the uh, pull request comment. So the developer knows that this failed because they had a, a merge issue. Um, if it fails for an infrastructure issue, the same information is put up there, and as I said, the test is restarted. Um, I also, um, uh, you know, things like compile and link errors are pretty easy to identify, so those all get flagged and posted into those comments and hip chats as well. The failure of every build or test is compared with the results of previous tests. So if it's a pull request and it's targeting the develop branch or a feature branch, I look at that branch that's previously been tested to see whether it has similar failures, and I compare the test failures in a, in a branch with the test failures in the pull request and identify the common failures so that I can let developers know that, yeah, you had three tests that failed, but, but two of those were already in the commit because somebody put something in the branch they shouldn't have, and only one of those new failures is yours, so you really only need to look at one of them. Um, the same thing with the build failure. If a build fails and I can identify that the previous uh, build also failed, I'll let developers know about that. 
Um, here's an example of a comment that would have gone into the Bitbucket pull request UI. So in this case, three tests failed out of 864, but two of those are new failures and one match failures that were already in the last committed test to the target branch. So you can click on that blue link and it will take you to that test so you can see which, uh, which uh, of the individual tests failed there and then there's also a link to take you to your test results so you can identify which one was yours and which one came from the, uh, the target branch that your pull request is going into. So that's a brief explanation of my system and the, what I've done to try and meet the challenges I face. And I'm going to turn it over to Ali to talk about his uh, QE pipeline. Thanks, Bill. OK. Uh, I'm going to go through it a little bit faster than I originally planned, so I can actually spend some time on the demo. And uh, we also have some time for Q&A. Uh, so my slides are really focused on you know, our journey into Jenkins, uh, what, how we got there initially, what was our vision, how the vision changed because the ground realities changed, and where we are currently, and uh, all the mistakes that we made, hopefully that you can uh, learn from those mistakes as well. Uh, you know, Splunk invests a lot of time in QA. Uh, any of you who have worked in enterprise software before will understand that it is a very difficult beast to test uh, because a lot of you know, things that are just uh, you know, integral to enterprise software. Uh, for instance, Splunk is distributed it's a distributed application, so it is it requires a large, it requires a very complicated test setup. It requires a very complicated test architecture. Uh, in addition, it works on all platforms. Not only that, you can also deploy it many different ways on the on prem or on cloud. So, this introduces a lot of complexities. Uh, the testing itself is also destructive in nature. We want to make sure that what happens when a search head goes down or indexer goes down, this, a Splunk performed the way it's supposed to. Uh, that means that technically every test can ask for its own deployment. So we don't have the model where you deploy it once, everyone will test against that deployment, where you, in some companies you will have staging, dev, and QA environments. We don't really have those. We have as many deployments as you want. So that really, really increases the testing complexity. It also means that you have to process a lot of the testing data when it comes back. You know, are we ready to ship this product or not? Well, there's 10,000 builds to go through. Uh, so our initial rollout strategy for QA, uh, or Jenkins rollout strategy, was well, what is everyone else doing? So I talked to a lot of friends who are in the industry, and it seems like the, the pattern was you know, we should empower engineers to do what they want to do. Give them access. Everyone's smart, and they will do the right thing. So obviously, you want to be cool. Um, so let's empower everyone and get on Jenkins. Uh, you know, as long as we monitor Jenkins, the system is up. You know, we have enough resources. Things should be fine, or that's what we thought. So everyone gets a Jenkins job. You have full access. You do whatever you want to do. Um, and you know, for for a few months, it worked fine till. Uh, and then results weren't so positive. Uh, we started noticing that it just became a complete mess. No one knew what was going on. Uh, you don't know who wrote the job. Maybe the guy who wrote the job has already left the company, and you have 10 jobs which are failing, but you don't know why they're failing. Uh, you know, there was no, there was complete lack of ownership. Jenkins itself was having scalability problems and uh, infrastructure issues. So now your star engineer who's responsible for making this kick-ass feature to bring revenue into the company is now trying to figure out you know, why are my tests failing on Jenkins. So this really became uh, kind of a nightmare for a bunch of people uh, in the company. Uh, in addition to all those issues, you know, we still have to get the tests. We still have to verify if the tests are passing or failing. People still have to go through Jenkins to triage everything. So this is what we really ended up doing is just Every day, every hour, just trying to figure out you know, what's wrong uh, in the system. We were not fixing the underlying cause, which is, in my opinion, was bad architecture. Uh, just like how you would not create your own software without a well thought of architecture, I think Jenkins is similar. You really need to think it through. You know, is this going to work in the long term? Um, so you know, what are we to do? You know, our dilemma was, we don't even know where to start. You know, things are, were there for a reason. They were working, but that, now they're not. What if you try to fix something and bricks something else? So you know, we, let's skip all the stages of grief and understand that this is the reality, accept, and move on. So 
you know, and it's not meant to really discourage engineers in our team. It was really, you know, it was a great first attempt. We learned a lot. We still managed to ship the product, uh, but it didn't quite scale. So let's kind of take, uh, take some lessons from it and let's figure out how to build a brand new architecture that's really hopefully uh, built for the future. Uh, so what we decided was, so before I go into a new team setup, one of the questions we wanted to ask ourselves was, uh, what kind of culture do we want to have in the team? You know, I think you, have, you can have two choices. One is, you know, you could be the kind of culture where everyone does everything. You know, you write your feature code, you actually test it, you deploy it all the way. Or you could think, you could be a team where everyone's super focused. You know, you are a developer, you're really focused on building these new features or your QA, and to really remove those distractions. Uh, and I've seen it work both ways. Uh, for something, for a company like Splunk, and what, we're, what we were trying to do in our organization, uh, we wanted to remove all distractions from uh, the product development team. So we broke up the team into two teams, um, the QA tools and architecture, that's the team I run, and regular QA engineering. Um, our focus was to be laser focused on the needs of the QA team. You can think of us as a services organization for the QA team. Anything that you need to get your job done we will do it. Uh, it's a 24-7 staff team across all geographies, so anytime anything goes wrong in any location, there is someone in that location to help you out. Uh, in addition, we do all deployments and infrastructure, so your tests at runtime can ask, hey, I need a search egg cluster with 100 nodes set up. We will do that for you. It's an API call that they make to us, and we deliver it somehow on AWS or OpenStack or Docker. Um, in addition, we also manage Jenkins, and we really focus on analytics, not just for QA and developers, but also for management, so that you don't get that dreaded email, you know, where is my TPS reports? They can just go to Splunk and can see analytics of, uh, can see quality KPIs in real time. Uh, and QA engineering, we just wanted to keep it simple, you know, just focus on the product, make sure the product works. Uh, work with your developers, make sure that you know, what you're testing is uh, working correctly. Um, so how do we resurrect Jenkins? Uh, you know, well, let's come up with some goals first. Uh, one thing we learned was letting everyone into Jenkins was a mistake. So let's keep it very limited. Only people who manage Jenkins should be allowed into Jenkins. Uh, and to really solve the problem, why were people going into Jenkins? You know, why were QA engineers going in? because people were writing their own test code and wanted to run those. So we, want, we invested a lot of time in the test architecture itself so that it plays very nicely with our CI infrastructure. Um, so in the test architecture, the current test architecture provides an abstraction layer inside of Jenkins so people can go build their job in Jenkins using build flow and can do high level things like run all the smoke tests or run all the integration tests that goes through the Jenkins workflow, which I'll show in a little bit, uh, and that will just dispatch all your tests into Jenkins and pump the results back into uh, Splunk. Uh, and also performance tune uh, Jenkins a lot. Uh, we currently run about four or 500 slaves per master, and there's multiple masters, so the amount of testing that we do at Splunk is very extensive. Uh, I'll show you some stats later. Um, and obviously, as I talked about, you know, leverage Splunk for everything. Uh, it, would be wrong, it would be wrong not to use Splunk uh, at Splunk. Uh, there's a lot of data that Jenkins produces, uh, and you'd be surprised the kind of things you find once you start ingesting that kind of data. Uh, so this is kind of our new workflow. Uh, it's very simple. We, we wanted to throw all the jobs that we had before and really condense it down to a few jobs. If you really think about it, in the QA world, um, all the jobs, what they were really doing were testing Splunk on different platforms. Maybe you had a job for UI testing. Maybe you had a job for lin testing Splunk on Linux, on Windows. Um, so we thought of this thing, like every job should be fairly generic because it's doing the same thing. It's going to Bitbucket, getting the code, it's setting up the environment, and then it's running your, you know, we are PyTest, Python, web driver shop. Uh, so everyone was doing the same thing. Uh, what we have is the top level is where, um, as Bill described in his presentation, where the jobs get their personality from. Um, you pass in certain parameters, like I'm not sure if the text is too small, but things like where do you want to run this job? So 
Linux or Windows, what kind of jobs, what kind of tests do you want to run? Uh, in this case, we're passing markers uh, that will actually go into the second layer, uh, which is the dispatch layer. What the dispatch layer does is two things primarily. One is it makes sure that we stay within the, the high li the, in the limits that Jenkins performs well. So we know that after 400 slaves, the master starts uh, misbehaving. So we don't want to dispatch more jobs if the master is already pretty slammed. So the dispatcher kind of uh, keeps an eye out on the load. And then once the load, is, uh, once the load is acceptable, it will actually go, based on the markers that you specify, it will actually go collect all the jobs and figures out, oh, there's 10,000 tests I want to run. Uh, let me group them up and dispatch it to different jobs so that you get, you know, your runtime is a lot less. So now the, the model changed, which is everyone does not get a Jenkins job anymore. Everyone gets a build. And I don't care how many builds you want. Just go crazy. Uh, we will make sense of it. As long as you follow the standards and stay within the guidelines, uh, things will work. Uh, so the, the, the upside, or you can say a downside, depending on how you look at it, was everything was working. Now you're getting thousands of builds a day. That means that's a lot of data to process. That's a lot of test results to go through. Uh, every, every build has console logs from Jenkins, has the test results themselves, and also a lot of artifacts, which have you know, Splunk crash logs, maybe Splunk server logs, and maybe three or four other things. This is some stats from I pulled last night. Uh, number of builds that we do per day. Uh, this is QA integration jobs. Uh, you know, 4,000 on average a day. Uh, and during, you know, release times, it goes up to all the way to 7,000 builds. Uh, number of integration tests per day, close to two, upwards of 200,000 every day. So now imagine if, you're, if your job in QA is to triage stuff every day, there's just no way you can do it. I mean, these tests will not always be passing, right? They're integration tests, you'll have a lot of failures. So there needs to be a very powerful way of going through these results. And there's a hint, starts with an S, uh, Splunk. <laughs> uh, so some of the use cases we had were, uh, you know, let's, we're gonna build something and we're gonna build it for the community and we're gonna use it ourselves. So what are the use cases uh, that we have for Jenkins? So in Jenkins, you're either administrator, release engineer, sysadmin, uh, you know, you wanna make sure that Jenkins masters are running, things are healthy. Uh, maybe you're in a big company where you have multiple Jenkins masters. Uh, maybe you talk to Andy and it turns out, you know, he's running a Jenkins master under his desk. I've seen that happen. Um, you know, there's security and audit issues. You know, who's going in and modifying things? Maybe you're doing um, deployments. Uh, you want to keep track of who's modifying your deployment jobs. Um, as administrators, you want to see, always bring efficiency into your Jenkins pipeline. So queue times really matter, build times really matter, long running tests, those kind of things really matter. Uh, and one thing really important, console logs. Sometimes you have long running jobs and they might take two hours to run, but the error happened like in the first 10 minutes. You know, you wanna know right away when the error happened, just kill the job, you know? So that's some of the use cases that we have for administrators. And for normal users, you know, there's some overlap and also normal users also really care about uh, test analytics. That's where I come from, that's near and dear to me. Um, so. Our solution was uh, twofold. Uh, we decided to build a plugin for Jenkins that basically intercepts every activity that's happening inside of Jenkins. So think of creating a job, deleting a job, modifying a job, running anything. Uh, and that sends all the data to Splunk in real time. Uh, in addition, you know, a lot of the Jenkins folks out here might not be Splunk experts. You might be a little bit intimidated by writing your own searches or dashboards. So we wanted to you know, give you something like, that you can get started right away with. So there's a Splunk app for Jenkins now. Um, so the plugin, again, it's very easy to configure. Just like a normal Jenkins plugin, there's nothing to do. If you're already a Splunk shop, you just put in a few values and data will start flowing into Splunk. Uh, you don't have to change any jobs, nothing. Uh, and the Splunk app for Jenkins, again, it's a uh, standard Splunk app you can install in two minutes. It has a bunch of pre-selected, pre-configured dashboards that we've created, which we think you will find super useful. Uh, maybe you'll get 80% you know, of your job done. Uh, specifically designed or tested within release engineering team at Splunk, uh, QA, QA engineering team, and as well as some Jenkins admins. 
Um, so live demo, let's see how we're doing on time. We're good. All right, so I've got, oops. Ah. All right. Bill, do you know how to get to Chrome? <laughs> You're on the screen, but not here. Oh. Interesting. Okay. Um. All right. You can exit For some power reason, it's, it's in a completely different space now. How do you switch spaces? Who is a Mac expert here? I can't <laughs> see what's going on. I should be a Mac expert. Oh, I just quit. There we go. You go to Sorry, Windows. Folks, give us a second here to uh, get our act together. And where's Mirror Displays? Why isn't it? Mirror's not Mirror Displays. There we go. All right. Great. Now we can get back to. Uh, yeah. That's okay. I don't worry about anything else. All right. So, so I've set up a little demo environment. Um, okay. Great. Uh, I've set up three Jenkins masters uh, with just running a bunch of jobs that are available publicly on GitHub. Uh, these jobs, they're passing, failing, there's agents, there's slaves that are connected, disconnected, and whatnot. Uh, just wanted to show you the section. Uh, this is the section, once you install the plugin, uh, you can, sure. Let me know when that, all right. So this, once you install the plugin, you basically see this configuration section in Jenkins where you can specify where your Splunk instance is. Uh, specify the HTTP token, that's how we send data. Uh, and there is a bunch of configurations that you can add in this, in this metadata area. Uh, in addition, you can also specify you know, what kind of things you, oops, what kind of things you wanna collect. Uh, maybe you wanna, any job that has artifacts matching a certain pattern, you just wanna collect them and send it to Splunk. You can, add, you can send as little or as much data as you want. We're not trying to use your Splunk license, so you know, yes, we will by default send a lot of data, but you can definitely control that and tune it down if there's data that you don't really care about. <coughs> uh, in addition, once you install the plugin, what you'll notice is uh, we kind of inject the Splunk logo in a bunch of places. So you can see on the left-hand side, there's a Splunk logo. Uh, if you click on it, it'll take you to the overview screen on the Jenkins app. Um, you will also see it, it'll take you different places depending on where you're uh, clicking at. Um, so let's see, oh, Bill, you have to log on to the VPN. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So you'll see the logo in um, you know, the, the main screen on Jenkins. You'll also see it in, on the job. Uh, when you click on the job logo, it will actually take you to this place called the build analysis page where you can see everything about the job. Maybe you care about the build times, maybe you care about how long it's been failing for or what the pattern is. Um, and then there's also places for test analytics, which will take you to a special area on the app where you can really drill down and make sense of all the failures that are happening. Uh, and also on the agent itself. Um, you can go to the agent and see maybe the agent activity, what kind of jobs have built on the agent, if the agent itself is healthy or not. All right, so I'll show you that I was not actually bluffing. This thing actually does work. Um, so you can see there's a Splunk logo here as well. So if I click on it. So this is the Splunk app. Um, it'll take me to, because I clicked on it from the job section, it takes me to the build analysis side. Uh, but before I go here, let me kind of walk through the app from the beginning. Um, sorry? Oh, zoom in up, oh, yep, totally forgot. All right, so one cool thing is I can select all the masters uh, all in one place. I can see across 10, 20, 30 masters, you know, what's going on, how many builds are failing. Uh, I'm going to select the masters that I care about that are for this demo, uh, master one, two, and three, and I can see for the last seven days, this is what, our, what my build status is looking like. Uh, I can actually click on it, and in real time, it'll actually you know, uh, filter out those builds and only show me the ones I clicked on. So I just clicked on fail, failed builds, and it showed me those. Um, let's see if I can show, 
It also shows me things that are running right now, so I can see one build that's running called Dummy Sleepy Job. <laughs> uh, it also shows me a visualization of what my, arch what my infrastructure looks like. So I can see I have three masters. Uh, this is the live state of my Jenkins infrastructure right now. I have three masters who you can kind of trace the path that they're running certain jobs and they're running on particular slaves. Especially useful, sometimes your Jenkins slaves are absolutely hosed and you have no idea why things are breaking. Well, maybe this slave doesn't have that much capacity. Maybe you want to rebalance your labels and uh, have you know, jobs distributed more evenly. So now let's say um, I want to actually analyze a particular build. And I'm going to use some data that I know has good stuff to show you guys. Um, so I'm going to use a master that is our sandbox called QTI Jenkins. Um, and I can search directly for anything that's failing. Everything will update that right away as a, as a typical Splunk feature, nothing fancy. But I have a job that I know. Uh, it's called Generic Test Cube Linux. This is our, the generic job that I was talking about. And I'm going to show you a build that has a good number of failures so you can see you know, what kind of stats we actually show you. So once I kind of filter down to what I, you know, I'm looking for, uh, I can actually expand this out, and it shows me a little bit, like a very small summary of what this job contains. So I can see that this particular job has a bunch of things that were injected inside of it. Um, can you guys still see or is this too small? Okay, let's do this. So just remind me if it's small again in case I forget. Um, so I can see that there's eight tests that failed. I actually care about it. Let me see what actually happened. So I click on it, opens a new tab, and it shows me some uh, interesting trends about the build itself. So I can see, you know, there's actually no queue time, so that's great. Uh, build times are kind of all over the place, something to look at. Uh, I can actually investigate directly to see if, oh, let me see what this, this build, build times we're doing. I can click on it and go to the actual job itself. Um, this is, for, the, for that particular job itself, it's, uh, it's trends over the course of seven days. Like, you can see that it's kind of fluctuating all over the place. There's a bunch of greens and reds signifying failures and successes. And in these seven days, you know, we had 56% uh, pass and the rest failed. So definitely something we need to investigate. Uh, I can also go to the build summary, which just most of the information here is what you would see in Jenkins uh, environment variables. We do capture all those and send it to Splunk. Uh, test results, that's my favorite area. Um, I want to see trends. I want to see what's going on. Like, are we, are we getting better or are we getting worse? Um, you know, maybe I just care about the failure trends. Uh, you know, we also care about reducing the overall runtime. So let's see the runtime distribution of these tests. So I can see, you know, like, you know, most of my tests are within, you know, one, and within 1,000 1, seconds. There are some that are quite large that I might, might want to uh, click on and see and maybe talk to the QA engineers to see, hey, is there anything we can do to improve the runtime of these tests so we can actually reduce the overall build time of the job? Uh, logs and artifacts. Uh, I'm sure all of you can understand how difficult and painful it is to go through the console logs in Jenkins. Uh, you might install plugins that do regexes to figure out what kind of errors you might be having. Uh, a better way would be to just use Splunk. Uh, you can go through the, you can just do a search and it'll tell you, you know, whatever you're looking for. In addition, if you had artifact collection enabled, uh, then I can, I not only collect, we not only collect the console logs, we also collect any of the artifacts that are attached to your build. That's extremely powerful if you're doing, if you have a lot of artifacts attached to your build. That means, again, you don't have to go to Jenkins, you can actually search for them directly in Splunk, and you can create alerts on them. If anything happens in the artifact or in the console log, you know, you'll get an alert and you can take appropriate action. Um, okay, now let's go to uh, the tests results again, and I'll go from here to the test analytics site. So this is something problematic to me. I want more details about this. I can just click on test results, um, opens a new page, and tells me more about that particular build. I can see uh, these are all the tests that are failing. Uh, this is extremely important. Uh, you know, if a QA is in the business of trying to figure out, you know, 
did we introduce a regression uh, error? Is this build good or not? This is extremely useful. I can see, I can tell the developer exactly when this started failing. Uh, we you know, make sense of all, because we collect all the data, we can actually show you when the regression happened. Um, maybe I want to search for any tests that are greater than, whose duration is greater than 1,000. I can filter easily. Uh, there's a quick filter that basically filters on any of the test attributes that you see in the report. Um, I can also group test uh, by errors. So when you have hundreds of failures, how do you know which one to fix? Maybe you should fix the ones that have the most occurrences. Um, so I can see two of them, and I got the queue that I'm running out of time. So we'll go to Jenkins Health really quick, um, and this shows me the master health. I can see what's going on on my masters. Uh, I can also see a real-time tail of the Jenkins, uh, Jenkins master log. I don't have to SSH into it. I can see directly in Splunk. Um, and then I can see the health of my agents, see what's online, what's running, what's not running, directly go from here into Jenkins if I want and take appropriate action. Um, so that's and one last thing before I go get kicked out is uh, we also have audit logs. Uh, I, I can tell you. Uh, who's logging into your system, who's changing what files, what configs, um, and then you can actually view the config directly here. Uh, you don't have to go to Jenkins. And I just wanted to wrap this up, um, and then uh, it's not released today. Uh, we were really trying, but we didn't, we didn't quite make it in time. Uh, but if you do care about uh, you know, being notified, you can just go to Oops, you can just go to surveymonkey.com slash, oops, all right, uh, slash r slash Splunk desk Jenkins, and we'll notify you as soon as the plugin is ready. We're anticipating a couple of weeks, and it should be ready. Uh, and just one last slide, just the people who actually contributed to it, uh, it's teams in San Francisco, Seattle, and Shanghai. Uh, they can't be here today, but this would not be possible without them. Um, so we'll open up for questions. Yes, the question is what kind of log files are sent to Splunk and can we configure that? Uh, by default, the Jenkins console log itself is sent. Uh, and by default, we don't send, I have to check the configuration, but you have full power in specifying which files you want to send and which files you don't want to send. Yeah, I mean, normal, I mean, Splunk server, if you have Splunk at your company, that will be just fine. You don't need a special Splunk for this thing. Okay, so I think I'm all out of time. Uh, we'll be right here on the side to ask. Uh, if you have any questions, just please come, and we'll be more than happy to answer. All right, thank you. Thank you.